Hi, I'm Celso Regino and I will talk about the immediate evaluation of phacomatosis. Phacomatosis are a group of unrelated disorders. They are grouped together from a histological standpoint because of skin and CNS lesions. The skin and CNS lesions are different in all of these disorders. So let's start with the neurofibromatosis type 1, also known as the von Hecklenhaus disease. It's the most common neurocutaneous syndrome. It's a disorder of CNS substance with astrocytomas, armor tomas, and neurofibromas. The general incidence is between 1 per 3,000 to 5,000 persons. It's an autosome dominant disease and the gene locus in the chromosome 70 has a complete penetrance with variable phenotypes. There are dynamically reactive dysplastic white matter lesions characterized by focal areas of signal intensity and non-specific bright foci. It is located in the globus pallidus, dentate nuclei, thalamus, and brainstem. Astrocytoma is most likely in the visual pathway gliomas, neurofibromas, like you can see here in this picture, vascular dysplasia, skin lesions, the most classic one is the café or spots that can be seen here also, and the dysplastic skeletal lesion. 10% of patients can have scoliosis, like cervical, thoracic, cephalosis. Other recognized association lesions can be found. It can be vascular, other tumors, tumor-like lesions, ADAD, and also the musculoskeletal anomalies as well. Talking now about specific image findings, we were going to start with the white matter lesions. It's mostly located in the dentate nuclei, globus pallidus, thalamus, brainstem pons, also in the midbrain, and lastly in the hippocampus. It's a full size of myelin vocalization, and there is no demyelination or inflammation associated in this lesion. The vacuolar myelination appears around 3 years old. It can enlarge until the age of 12 and then reduce in size and numbers. And over the age of 20, all the lesions may resolve. Around 50% of patients have microcephaly. Maybe due to the increased gray and white matter, also you can see that the corpus callosus is enlarged in these patients. Post-chiasmatic gliomas grow faster than pre-chiasmatic ones. And the armor tomas have abnormal ADCs. And on spectroscopy, they have normal to moderate high choline and low NAA. This is a case of a young kid, it's a boy of 7 years old. They have armor tomas in the brainstem characterized by bright spot on T2s, with the images also on the globus pallidus and some slight areas of hyperintensity on the thalamus. On the coronal view, you can see enlargement of the optic nerves and also the chiasma that correspond to glioma of the visual pathway. In the diagnostic criteria for NF1, you need to have two or more of the following. More than six cafe spots that should be larger than 15 millimeters in adults and 5 millimeters in children, more than two neurofibromas or one plexiform neurofibroma, axillary and inguinal freckling, visual pathway glioma, more than two lynch nodules, distinct bone lesion, and first degree relative with NF1. Pilocytic astrocytoma is the most common visual pathway glioma and corresponds to 15% of the patients. Visual pathway glioma is found in one-third of NF1 patients, but is frankly malignant in less than 20% of the cases. Clinically, the patient can present visual loss, hypothalamic dysfunction, and some of the cases and tumors can regress spontaneously.
You have here a case of enlargement asymmetrical of the optic nerves with contrast enhancement and also some extension to the visual pathway on the T2s and the coronal T1 pause GAD. As you said, some gliomas can regress spontaneously, so there is an example here. As you can see in the follow-up MR studies, there is less contrast enhancement and also the lesion size is reduced. Another not so common finding in the MRI study is the isphenoid wing absence and is associated with plex form tumors. You can see enlargement of middle cranial fossa and sometimes you can find ipsilateral propitosis associated like here you can see in this good example. Let's move on to neurofibromatosis type 2. It's less common than NF1. It's also an autosome dominant with a defect the chromosome 22. It's a disorder of CNS covering and the mism is a usual mnemonic for NF2, but the initials of multiple intercranial schwannoma, meningioma, and ependymoma. There is less common tumor that can be associated to NF2, and ocular and skin abnormalities can be very common in this disease. Classically, NF2 is characterized by schwannomas of cranial nerves, mostly in the 8th, followed by the 5th, 9th, and 10th, and of the spinal nerve roots. They are associated with meningiomas, ependymoma in the spinal cord and brainstem can be seen, and the other signs and symptoms like scoliosis, paraplegia, and cataracts can also be found in these patients. To completely fulfill the diagnostic criteria for NF2, you should have bilateral vestibular schwannomas or a first degree of relative with NF2 plus one vestibular schwannoma or two of the following neurofibroma, meningioma, glioma, schwannoma, and posterior subcapsular opacity. This is a case of NF2. We have bilateral uh, vestibular schwannoma and also multiply meningiomas and in the spinal cord you also see some schwannomas as well. The next facomatose they're gonna talk is the tuber sclerosis complex, also known as the Bourneville disease. It's an autosome dominant with prevalence of one per 10,000 to 20,000 persons. The gene abnormality is located in the chromosome 9 and 16. It is a disorder with multi-organ armor thomas. The classic triad is only found 30% of the patients and it consisted with facial angiofibroma, mental retardation, and seizure. Tuber sclerosis is characterized by subependymal nodules or amartomas found in almost 100% of the case, can be calcified, can contrast enhancement. 10 to 15% of patients can have subependymal giant cell astrocytoma, and from 70 to 95% of patients can have cortical and subcortical tubers. White matter lesion along the line of neuron migration can be also seen, as well as cyst like white matter lesions. The diagnostic criteria can divide and define probable and possible diagnosis. They have major and minor features. And the very common major feature that should point out is the facial angiofibroma, hypomelanotic maculus, cortical tubers, and subependymal nodules. There is another other uh, findings in signals and also involving other organs like lungs, kidney, heart, and should be aware and should fulfill the criteria to make the correct diagnosis. We should point out that tuber sclerosis is a multi-system disease. Here we have listed some associated abnormalities, like the involvement of the kidney with lesions like angiomyolipomas and cysts. It can also involve the heart, the lung with cystic 
lymphangiomatosis and fibrosis, as well as facial angio, angiofibroma, and also involvement of the eyes and the skin. The best sequence to identify the cortical tubers is the flare. It may calcify and have six degeneration. The cortical gyners may expand and have some distortion. The presence of cortical tubers and migration line are non-specific unless you have more than three of those. The migration lines are better seen on T1 sequence, especially if you add some empty sepals. T2 and flare can also be a good sequence to identify them. The first manifestation may be an infant in spasms like seizures. Armatomas in temporal lobes can be correlated with autism. ADAD and aggression may be seen in tuberous sclerosis. The best sequence to identify subependymal node is T1. It's mostly located between the ventricular artery and Monroe foramen. 30 to 80 percent can contrast enhancement, and calcification can be best depicted with the T2 greater than Necron and SWI and Swan sequence. If it's not calcified, the subependymal nodes are the more major criteria for the diagnosis of tuberous sclerosis. It's correlated with learning disabilities, but not their location. Here we have some example uh, showing some calcification of the subependymal nodules, best seen on T1 sequence, and also showing some contrast enhancement and also calcification on the susceptibility sequence. 5 to 20% of patients can have subependymal giant cell astrocytoma. Typically, it's located in the lateral ventricles near the foramen marrow. Uncommon sites have been described in the temporal horn of the ventricles, atrium, third ventricle, and pineal green gland, as well as the cerebral hemisphere. Other tumors in tuber sclerosis is very rare, but it can be associated has been described. Here in the bottom line, you have two patients with examples of subependymal giant cell astrocytoma located in the foramen marrow and also in the lateral subependymal ventricular, showing some kind of calcification and contrast enhancement. Schwarz-Weber disease is also known as encephalotrigeminal angiomatosis. It is an sporadic congenital malformation with an incidence of 1 per 50,000 person. It is characterized by lack of cortical veins and larger deep medullary veins draining into choroid plexiglamus. 8% of bioinvolvement are unilateral, mostly occur in the occipital lobes followed by the parietal and then the frontal temporal lobes. Facial and retinal angiomas have an incidental distribution along branches of trigeminal nerves. Facial angioma in the distribution V1 and V2 is a very typical finding. Pre-findings can be listed as the no facial angioma in the patient, facial angioma contralateral to the pioneer one and oral pyogenic granulomas. Seizures can be found in 9% of the cases. One third to two third of patients have hemiparesis. Stroke-like episodes, neurological deficit, migraines, and development delay are commonly seen. Almost all patients have facial nevus flamus. 7% of patients has glaucoma. Other findings can be retinal telangiectic vessels and scleral angiomas. The image features are sequel of progressive venous occlusion and chronic venous ischemia. The most commonly image finds are cortical calcifications, atrophy, and the large ipsilateral choroid plexus.
This example shows the early phase findings of Sturge-Weber disease. At the RCBV perfusion map, there is an transient hyperperfusion. An accelerated myelin maturation is observed at the arrows pointed in the axis T1 weighted image. And the T1 pause gaps show a leptomeningeal enhancement and a pyoangiomatosis. Most prominent findings can be seen in the late phase illustrating the examples below. Atrophy, gliosis, cortical calcification, burnout, less bioenhancement seen in the T1 pause gap, tick diploid, hyperpneumatization of paranasal sinus, and the port Weinstein is very well demonstrated here. MR and geography can demonstrate a pulse of normal cortical veins, an extensive medullary and deep collaterals, and a progressive synovenous occlusion. Schroeder Weber disease can be classified in three different types. The type 1, the classic, has a leptomeningeal and facial angiomas associated with glaucoma. The type 2, incomplete, you can have facial angioma and glaucoma. The type 3, the atypical, you see only the leptomeningeal angioma. Von Himpolido syndrome is an autosome dominant disease with an incidence of 1 per 35 to 50,000 person. There is an involvement of six different organ systems, such as eye, ear, and CNS, with multiple lesions that can be cystic, vascular tumors, or carcinomas. Between the tumors, it's mostly finding are the hemangioblastoma, Fell chromocytomas, clear cell renal carcinomas, cyst adenomas, isolated cell tumor of pancreas, and endolymphatic sac tumors. The diagnosis is based on the presence of two or more hemangioblastomas or one hemangioblastoma associated with retinal hemorrhage. Hemangioblastomas are typically multiplied, most occurring in the spinal cord followed by the cerebellum and less in the brain stem, mostly in the medulla. 7% of patients have associated with ocular angioma that, that can cause retinal detachment and hemorrhage. 25 to 4% of patients with hemangioblastomas has von Hippolindo syndrome. In this example below, there is an expensive cystic lesion with an enhancing mural nodule in the right cerebellum hemisphere. In the RCBVs, you can see that the enhancing portion of the lesion has high perfusion and low diffusion. There is another tiny nodule with an enhancement in the upper of the spinal cord and also in the cerebellum. In these other examples, you can see foci for contrast enhancement that correspond to hemangioblastomas in the cerebellum. They have high diffusibility and high perfusion due to the high vessel density in the enhancing lesions. A sagittal T1 pause GAD can be seen also foci for contrast enhancement that correspond to hemangioblastomas. In the abdominal imaging, you can see renal cysts bilateral in the scar in the superior portion of the kidney, left kidney, secondary to a pause operative of renal cell carcinoma. An island cell carcinoma in the pancreas tail is also demonstrated in the exo T1 image. This example of the literature shows the association of the hemangioblastoma seen in the right cerebellum hemisphere with an endolephat sac tumor in the left side and ocular angioma causing retinal detachment and hemorrhage. Face of face syndrome is an acronym formed by the initials of the posterior fossil malformation, mostly dendwalk complex,
hemangiomas, arterial anomalies, coarctation of a water and cardiac anomalies, eye or ocular anomalies, external clefting or and super umbilical breath. The diagnosed criteria is, is defined by the presence of the characteristic segmental hemangioma or head hemangioma larger than 5 cm and one major or two minor criteria. CNS findings are neurovascular abnormalities, posterior fossa malformation, mostly dent walker complex, cerebellar hemisphere hypoplasia or agenesis, corpus callosus hypoplasia, intracranial hemangiomas, and unilateral microphthalmia. Vascular malformations very common on face syndrome and are very well demonstrated by both MRA and CTA. The most common finds are hypoplasia or absence of internal carotid, the posterior cerebral artery, and pica. The presence of aneurysm, moya moya, aortic art anomalies and abnormalities of supra aortic trunk, and persistence of embryonic arteries. This is an example of face syndrome in a very young child that has a facial hemangioblastoma, a cortation of the aorta, dent wall complex and some vascular anomalies like aneurysm and hyperplasia of internal carotid. The Coden syndrome is also known as the Coden Lehmidiclos syndrome that is now considered a phacomatosis. It is an autosome dominant disease with a mutation in the PT gene found in 80% of patients. Is characterized by a multiple hematoma syndrome that can be found in the breast, thyroid, uterine, skin. There can be also lipomas, hemangioblastomas, microcephaly that is associated with mental retardation, GI hemorrhagic polypos, and lehmidiclo that is a cerebral hematoma also known as dysplastic ganglocytoma. This example shows the very typical image appearance of the Lehmidiclo disease. There is an expensive lesion in the right cerebellum hemisphere that has some lines inside the lesion very well demonstrated on both T1 and T2 weighted images. There is a slight hyperintensity on the fusion weighted images Spectroscopy do not show the high choline peak commonly seen in the tumors. There is a low NAA peak and a very high CBVs on perfusion images. 50% of patients with lehmidiclo disease has coding syndrome. The lesions do not grow or grow slowly. Recurrence post treatment is very rare. Hydrocephalus can be a common finding when there is a mass effect in the fourth ventricle. Association with breast and thyroid cancer is very common. Randall Oswald Weber syndrome or hemorrhagic hereditary telangiectasia is an autosome dominant disorder where the abnormality is located in chromosomes 9 and 12. Clinical onset by the age of 16 in 50% of patients and in 9% by the age of 40. The incidence is 1 per 5,000 to 8,000 person. It's characterized by multiple AVFs and AVMs that has less risk of bleeding than normal population. And there is also a lower aneurysm association. More than 9% of patients have recurrent epistaxis. Telangiectasia can be found in the skin and mucose membrane as well as in the viscera. Clinically, the patient can have GI bleeding, AVMs in the lung and brain, AV apectic shunting leading to encephalopathy, high output heart failure, 
and also chronic anemia. The diagnostic criteria is based on the presence of spontaneous recurrence ectasis, multiple telangiectasia in typical locations, proven visceral AVMs such as in the lung, liver, brain, and spine, and a first-degree family member with HAT. In this example, you can see some image finds of a patient with a Randall Weber syndrome. There is an AVF in the chest, AV in the hepatic shunting, and secondary MRI findings of encephalopathy in this T1 exo without gadolinium demonstrate a bright sign intensity in the globus pallidus secondary to manganese deposition. This other patient has skin and mucosal tenogenic disease, as well as uh, AVFs in the chest and also in the brain. Cerebral involvement is characterized by vascular malformations. 10% of patients have cerebral AVMs and the vast majority are silent. HHC patients are 20 times more likely to have a hemorrhage and stroke. Here you have some examples of vascular malformations such as cavernomus, DVAs, and also patients that have AVMs that are complicated with subarachnoid hemorrhage. In the example on the left side, the angiogram shows a capillary vascular malformation with a vascular blush that persists in the early venous phase. No dilatated arterial feeder or draining vein is seen. In the other example on the right side, a capillary malformation can be identified associated with hemosiderin deposit in the adjacent soci and the draining vein enlarged. Basal cell nevus syndrome is also known as the Golden Goat syndrome. It has a prevalence of 1 per 56,000 to 256,000 persons. Most common in the second and third decades is an autosomal dominant tumor syndrome, where more than 90% of patients have multiple basal cell epitheliomas and carcinomas in the sun exposure and radiation skin areas demonstrated in the picture on the left bottom side. More than 85% of patients have palmar plantar pits in the picture, picture on the bottom right side. 30% of patients can have odontogenic keratocysts of the jaws, demonstrated in the coronal CT pictures on the right side, as well as lamella fox, internal cerebri, and dura mera calcifications. 4 to 20% of patients have medulloblastoma, mostly boys, younger than 2 years old, and the prevalence of the most plastic type. Ventriculomegaly, callosodigenesis, and some other neoplasias that are associated is very common, such as skin carcinoma and also the ameloblastoma. To complete fulfill the diagnosis criteria of basal cell nevus syndrome, the patient must have two major criteria and one major and more than two minors. The major criteria are defined as multiply more than two basal cell carcinoma, odontogenic keratocysts of the jaws, three or more palmar or plantar pit, Bilamellar calcification of the Fox cerebri, ribs anomalies, and a first degree relative with basal cell nevus syndrome. Here we have two different examples. On the right side, an axial CT demonstrates a calcification in the tintorum of the cerebellum and also a small keratogenic cyst on the right side of the jaw. On the right side, there is a different patient where there is a bilateral characterogenic cyst in the jaws and also a calcification of the folks and also 
in the cerebellum tentorum. Let's talk now about some uncommon phacomatosis. We're going to start with the armor nevus syndrome. Classically, this patient have jettison nevus, demonstrating these two patients the picture on the right side, mental retardation, and seizures. Cranial anomalies most commonly demonstrated are hemimagnocephaly that you can see in these two examples below, associated with lateral ventricle dilatation, skull hypertrophia, and also neural migration disorders. Neurocutaneous melanosis is also known as RAIN syndrome and is characterized by giant or multiple cutaneous melanocytic nevi. Can be benign and malignant melanocytic lesion of left meninges. The melanosis can have spread in the visceral brown space in the left meninges or parenchyma. It can degenerate into melanomas. More than 6% of patients can have communicating hydrocephalus, probably uh, secondary to diffuse left meningeal in contrast enhancement. 10% can have the endwalk complex, and other finds can be arachnoid cyst and megacystana magna. This particular patient has a multiple cutaneous melanocytosis nevi. It's very characteristic from this syndrome is the bright spot, very symmetrical and bilateral in the amygdala, is a parenchymal melanosis and that don't cause mass effect and also can be identified in the cerebellum in other patients. The other patient has a giant cutaneous melanocytic nevi and a malignant leptomeningeal involvement of melanoma, resulting in a communicating hydrocephalus, melanosis, oculodermal water, or nevus of otter is a meningeal melanocytoma of brain and oculodermal melanocytosis. It's a solitary primary melanocytic tumor of CNS can be a well-defined melanocytoma or melanoma. It can be associated with meningeal melanocytoma with ipsilateral nevus of otter. It's most frequently in female teenagers with a hyperpigmentation in the trigeminal ramification, and 50% of patients can also have ocular involvement as a glaucoma or uveal or choroid melanoma. Here's an example from the literature demonstrated the ocular and the skin manifestation of the disease. In the same patient that was shown in the previous slide, there are a melanocytoma in the left temporal lobe with areas of hemorrhage with a level of hemorrhagic component and also a slight contrast enhancement, mostly peripheral. The melanofarcomatosis can be divided in hyper or hypomelanosis. The hypermelanosis can be divided and include the neurocutaneous melanosis and the melanosis oculodermal of otter, as previously seen. Now we are going to talk about the hypomelanosis of Ito. It's characterized by cutaneous hyperpigmentation that follow the blasco lines. The brain involvement can be uni or bilateral, and you can see on this picture on the right side in the flare sequence with enlarged PVS and abnormal hyperintensity on the white marrow. 70% of patients have intellectual disability and development delay. 4% have seizure, 15 muscular hypotonia, 25 have microcephaly, and most of them have multifocal pervascular space dilatated associated with hyper-signal intensity on T2 and flare sequence in the white mirror adjacent to the larger PVS. Also, most skeletal abnormalities can be uh, described like scoliosis, mostly in the thoracic and limb deformities. 10% of patients have cardiac defects and 25 ocular defects like strabism and stagnancy.
Other CNS abnormality findings can be dysplasia or hypoplasia of the corpus callosum and cerebellum, heterotopia, gyra, and polymicrogyra, periventricular cyst, and polyencephaly. This is a case of a patient that has cutaneous hyperpigmentation that follows the blasco lines. The brain MRI demonstrates a right hemimegalencephaly associated with polymicrogyra. Phacomatoses are a group of unrelated disorders. They are autosomal dominant that require genetic implications. Screening evaluation of first degree is relative and to establish a routine follow-up surveillance program. Thank you very much for your attention.